Amen. Would you remain standing as we open to our sermon text this morning? This morning we'll be in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 4. In your pew Bible, that'll be a page on, on page 998. Mark chapter 4, beginning in verse 35. <clears throat> These are the very words of God. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this? that even the wind and the sea obey him. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> well, it is always good and right for us to go to the Lord and ask him for guidance before we hear a sermon, so let's do that just now. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord our God, indeed, in your light do we see light, and your truth is truth. And so, Lord, as we open your word this morning, we pray that you would pour out your spirit upon us, that, that we may see Christ, and that we might be conformed more and more into his image, for it is in his name that we pray. Amen. <clears throat> well, about a decade ago, a New York Times best-selling book was released titled, The Boys in the Boat. The Boys in the Boat. And if I'm not mistaken, this is about an Olympic rowing team, and I, I hear it's a great story, a great narrative of perseverance and dedication, uh, but this title has always captured my attention because I see it everywhere, everywhere. I mean, no matter what bookstore I find myself in, I'll find it on the main shelves. I'll find it on the main tables just as you enter in the store. It seems to be a very popular book, and every time I see it, I'm reminded of the numerous Numerous significant events in our scriptures of boys on boats. We have, we have quite a few of them, do we not? Uh, think of the obvious one, Noah. Uh, one man and his family delivered from the wrathful waters to come. Think of the boy Moses as he is put and drifts down a river in what the original Hebrew describes as an ark. Think of Jonah, that, that ever-bubbly character of Jonah as, as he is sleeping in the belly of a boat and is tossed over the side to appease the wrathful waters. And here this morning, we've arrived at yet another narrative of boys on boats. And it's my privilege, really, my, my duty, I think, to suggest to you that, that this belongs in the Parthenon of those other boat narratives. In fact, I think you can argue that those other narratives are pointing to this particular narrative. There are aspects that we can find in each of these other narratives that sort of uproot or, and point to this text. And they all sort of circle around the identity of Jesus. Who then is this? that even the wind and the sea obey him. The disciples' words here at the end of the passage leave us in a somewhat ominous place, don't they? For they don't really answer it. Mark doesn't really answer it, at least not explicitly, right here. Rather, Mark seems to be reaching beyond the page and dropping this question into our very laps. Who do you say that this man is? Based on all that you've just seen and witnessed, who do you say this man 
is. Now, I know we are sort of dropping ourselves in the middle of Mark's gospel, uh, but believe it or not, Mark's entire gospel is sort of revolving around that question. Who is Jesus? And Mark's gospel is laser-focused on answering that question, and we can see that from the very first verse of Mark's gospel. You don't have to turn there with me if you wouldn't like, but Mark 1.1, 1, 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And Mark gives us two titles for Jesus, Jesus the Christ and Jesus the Son of God. And these are actually the two great confessions of Mark's gospel. Do you remember who confesses that Jesus is the Christ? Well, it's Peter. Remember, Jesus asked Peter, who do you say that I am? And Jesus says, you are the Christ. And then he proceeds to misunderstand what that means. And then, by the end of Mark's Gospel, chapter 15, we see the centurion declaring that this man surely is the Son of God. This man who has died on a cross. The two great confessions of Christ's identity are found in Mark 1.1. And so Mark sort of sets the tone for his gospel, answering this question, who Jesus is. And here, of course, we get the very question once again. Who then is this? And in this narrative, Jesus demonstrates exactly who he is. And it's worth noting on this ever-important question, who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him, that the answer may indeed uh, frighten you. At least it did the disciples. If you look at the end of our text, look at verse 41. They were filled with a great fear. Isn't that interesting? They were, they were frightened. This is the third, quote, great thing that we see in these short verses. First, we have the great windstorm in verse 37. The great calm in verse 39. And then the great fear in verse 41. And this will sort of form the, the backdrop of our sermon, the, the backbone, I should say. The great storm, the great calm, and the great fear. And I think a careful look at each of these three things will actually help us to round out this question, this ever-important question, who is Jesus? So first, the great storm. And first, we must acknowledge the simple fact that Jesus leads his people into this storm. Verse 35, Jesus said to them, let us go across to the other side. Now much is made of this text of Jesus sort of calming the storms of your life. And that can happen. Sometimes he may calm the storm of your life, but much less is made of the fact that Jesus actually leads his disciples into storms. It's clear, right? This was not the disciples' idea to go across to the other side. Now, this was no cruel act of fate or nature that this storm was thrust upon Jesus and his disciples. This was the idea of Christ himself. And why? Well, secondly, this storm was purposeful. The storm was purposeful. And more specifically, it was teaching the disciples a lesson. Now, why do I say that? Well, Mark chapter 4 can sort of be viewed as one whole unit. And what do we notice as we look at the beginning of Mark chapter 4? Mark chapter 4, verse 1 reads this way. Again, he began to teach beside the sea, and a very large crowd gathered about him, so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea, and the whole crowd was beside the sea on that land, and he was teaching them many things. Okay, so he's teaching them many things. He begins to teach them the purpose of parables. He teaches them the parable of the sower. He teaches them uh, the parable of the seed growing. The seed growing like the kingdom of God. The parable of the mustard seed. So time and time again, Jesus is teaching. And then we arrive at verse 35 and it reads, On that day. On the very same day Jesus was doing his teaching, in the very same boat in which he was doing the teaching, he gives the disciples their final lesson. And this lesson is primarily 
showing them who Christ is. But secondarily, I think, we can add it shows them a little bit about who they are. It teaches them a little bit about what the cost of discipleship may be. In fact, Mark is also focused on that quite a bit. Think of the blind Bartimaeus. As he has his sight restored, he follows Jesus, quote, on the way. And where does that way lead Jesus? Directly to the cross. Think of the disciples who end the book of Mark in the very same spot that Jesus began his ministry. Frightened and afraid. Mark has many things to say about the cost of of discipleship, the hard truth of what it means to follow Jesus. And discipleship of the Lord Jesus does not mean a life free of storms. In fact, as we see here, Jesus may lead you into storms. And by all accounts, uh, this is no small storm. We were told in verse 1 that evening had come, meaning to add insult to injury, there was darkness as, as the tempest draws near. There's a, there's a darkness that could be felt, perhaps. And, what's more, consider the fact that many of Jesus' disciples were indeed fishermen. You would think that if anybody could handle a storm, if anyone's used to a storm, it would be Jesus' disciples. But no, uh, they were quite frightened at this whole thing. Life is not uh, always easy for one who follows Christ, but it is made easier. It is made more manageable by knowing the character of the one we follow. We need to hear that lesson, and the disciples needed to hear that lesson. The storms do not just always go away, at least not all of them. But the storms are indeed viewed in a completely different light, as the disciples will find out in just a few moments. Who then is this? This is one who leads his disciples into storms, uh, but with great purpose. But in this case, as we move on to our second point, he does not leave them there. He replaces the great storm with a great calm. Yes, as we look at this great calm, the first thing I'd like us to notice here is a short uh, but crucial point, and that's that Jesus is in the midst of the storm with the disciples. He is there with them. He did not simply tell his disciples to go over to the other side while I stay here. He is in the storm. He is not far off, you could say, from his disciples. In fact, he is asleep. As they worry and panic, he is sleeping like Jonah of old in the boat. Uh, You could even say he was trusting, trusting in the sovereign will of God. And because secondly, Jesus not only brings a great supernatural calm, he actually demonstrates a great and supernatural calm. This is part of the lesson that Jesus is giving here. Jesus is demonstrating what a true and trusting and lively faith in this heavenly Father means. This is what it looks like, right? As the tempest billows and crashes and waves pour into the ship, he is resting and trusting. For while Jesus does indeed calm the storm, he demonstrates faith within the storm. For indeed, it is within the storm that your faith is going to be most valuable to you. But the disciples don't seem to get that. They aren't demonstrating that great faith. They are doing as as Martin Lloyd-Jones would say, that they're looking at the waves. They're, They're looking at the chaos around them. They're not looking at the Savior. They're looking at the storms of their lives. They're looking at the immediate threat as opposed to looking at Christ to the point where they they shake Jesus awake and they say teacher and that's significant that they call him teacher we'll talk about that in a moment do you not care that we are perishing do you not care about us do you not care about what we're going through do you not see that we're in pain that that we're frightened what are you doing sleeping do you not care about your people 
But Jesus rebukes the great storm and replaces it with a great calm. He stands and he rebukes and he demonstrates his absolute and sovereign power over the situation. He, of course, cares for his people. He demonstrates that. Of course, he cares for his people. And he does so by speaking a word of peace. Bringing peace into their very lives. He enters their experience, you could say. He enters our experience, is in the boat with us, and brings a peace to a roaring tempest. Who then is this? This is one who is with us in the storm. This is one who has power, even, over the storm. And thus his disciples are delivered. And wouldn't you think that this is a cause for celebration? Uh, Wouldn't you think that the disciples would then jump in the air, pumping their fists, and the movie would end, and the credits would roll? You might expect that. But that's not what we get. In fact, we get the exact opposite. Verse 41, they were filled with a great fear. And this brings us to our third and final portion this evening, the disciples' great fear. You see, after he rebukes the storm, after he calms the storm by the word of his power, he actually rebukes his disciples. Verse 40, he said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And here the text does something interesting. The fear that they had for the storm is now actually dwarfed by the fear that they feel for Christ. In fact, the word that they use here is phobia. You guys know what a phobia is? If you have arachnophobia, anytime you see a spider, you are sort of met with it with an intense fear and anxiety, almost a crippling anxiety. This is what the disciples felt when they saw Jesus calm the store. They were met with a phobic fear. And wouldn't you be? I mean, think about this. Wouldn't you be? What has this man just done? This man, one minute sleeping, the next is bringing a supernatural calm by the very word of his power, who just like, just like the Lord in Genesis 1-1 speaks and the creation responds. It's unbelievable. It's, it's majestic. This man, too, commands the wind and the sea. Who would be afraid of a little rain and a little wind when, when this man is in the boat with me? When this man who commands them both is here? This man who is mightier than the storm, who is bigger than the storm, who is sovereign over the storm, and yes, indeed, I think we can say in some senses even more frightening than the storm. Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Well, who else demonstrates such power over the waters? Who else flooded the earth back in Genesis 8? Who else parts the Red Sea that his people might go through? Who else draws out Leviathan with a fish hook, as Job might say? Who else but the very God of Israel? Who else but Yahweh himself has such power over the wind and the sea. Who else can still the stormy and wrathful seas of Jonah's day? Who else can bring salvation? Who else but Yahweh, the God of Israel, in the flesh? Who else but the King of all creation? Who else but the King of the kingdom of which He was just speaking. In fact, from here we see Jesus, of course, demonstrating power over nature, but then we'll see him demonstrating power over demons in the next portion of Scripture, then demonstrating power over even sickness and and health, and then indeed, even power over death. Who is this man? Who is this man? Jesus is showing his disciples, yes, teaching 
his disciples that he is the king who stills the chaotic, wicked waters of the world. Think of what that means in the, in the scope of redemptive history. Think of what that means as we read of all of the wrathful waters that we see present throughout the Old Testament. Jesus is calming this, this great, magnificent storm of God's wrath. That is what he is doing. That is what he will do. And he speaks a word of peace in turn. This man is sovereign over even the waters for this man is God. And this is a lesson that his disciples needed to learn both then and now. But how do they address Jesus? They shake him awake and say, Teacher, teacher, in Matthew's Gospel, some of the disciples are recorded saying, Lord, Lord. Here, the disciples say, Teacher. Friends, if Jesus is simply your teacher, then He is of no use to you in the storm. He is much more than just a teacher. He is God. In the flesh, sovereign over all things. As we close this morning, I want us to understand that this, this truly is the main point of the text. Who is Jesus? Jesus is God. That is the takeaway. Jesus is Yahweh in the flesh. But I also want us to notice how, how that answer sort of reshapes and contextualizes this passage for us. As we lay our heads down tonight, we might feel that we are in the midst of an anxious season. We might feel that we are in the midst of a storm. We might be concerned about friends, family, health, the church, the nation, any number of things. But consider how Christ speaks peace to you this morning. Who then is this? This is God who leads His disciples into storms. This is God who uses these storms to His own perfect ends. This is God who is with you in the midst of the storm. Always. Never far off. This is God who speaks a word of peace to you in the midst of the storm. This is God who is sovereign over the very storm into which you have been led. And what's more, this is God who enters the storm enters our experience and dies for the sheep. This is God who went to the cross with the names of His sheep on His mind. Each and every one of you. <clears throat> is His life and death not a testimony enough to the fact that He cares for you and that He loves you and He will not abandon you no matter how stormy life gets. Friends, in some sense, we can conclude from this text that Jesus, God, is worth fearing more than any storm that we might enter. But we also know that it is the testimony of the Scriptures that perfect love casts out fear. And has Christ not loved you perfectly unto the very end? I do hope and pray that the smiling face of Christ has dispelled any doubt of the Lord's love for you. One commentator on this text puts it this way. He says, The subduing of the sea and the wind was not merely a demonstration of power, though it was. It was an epiphany through which Jesus was unveiled to his disciples as not only sovereign, but Savior. Not only sovereign, but Savior in the midst of intense peril. The very same Jesus who delivered his disciples then delivers us now. The very same God then is present alive and working in our lives now. So may we be quick to look to him in times of intense peril. 
For who then is this? This is Jesus, Savior of his people and God over all. Let's pray. Our Lord and our God, indeed, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Christ who loved his people perfectly. He loved them unto the end. And so, Lord, as we pray, we, we take great comfort in knowing that Christ is alive and ruling even now, that he is orchestrating every bit of our lives and for his own glory and for our good. And Lord, may we take this truth and store it deep upon our hearts. Be with us now in a special way as we partake of the sacrament, for we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. At this time, would the elders come forward as we partake of the Lord's Supper?